Join me in the book of Philippians. Here we go. This massive letter of four chapters. <laughs> One of the most astounding little letters in the New Testament. It has a special feel to it. Special touch. The whole, the whole feel of, of, of what Paul is, is speaking to them. We started last week in, in uh, Acts when the, the, you know, the church was founded, when, when he actually was there and he got to know them, met them. Um, and so you'll, I wanted to start there in Acts 16 because, you know, it, it, it is all there. You'll feel it here. You'll, you'll feel the texture and the color of the way, of the way that church was, began, the, the way that church was started. And all the myths through this. And you'll feel joy. I mean, remember that church started in a prison with joy that no one could hardly get their arms around. Like you couldn't, how in the world are you singing and, and singing praises to God and praying to him after you've just been beaten up bad and thrown into prison? And, and there you were, and there's Paul and Timothy, and they're singing. And so goes the founding of the church with, in essence, the first Philippian person. I mean, Lydia was from Thyatira. So here comes the jailer. And you can bet when he writes this letter, the jailer's, you know, he's hearing these words. He references the beginning and in his opening remarks here. It's important to remember how the church started because Paul's back in prison again. Started in a prison, he's writing this letter under lockdown. Now, there's some measure of debate, debate to be, you know, had with regard to how severe is it. Does it, it probably didn't feel quite as ugly as it did in Philippi. Now he's in Rome, and he's under lock and guard. He may well have a chain on him. The word that he refers to no less than four times in chapter 1 that we interpret in the ESV as imprisonment can be interpreted as chains, my chains, my imprisonment. So you should picture him under, under arrest, and there's a guard there who knows that if Paul disappears, it could cost him his life. So no mistake here. There's persecution again, like Paul lived with it day in and day out. And so he writes this letter about 10 years. Acts 16 is somewhere around 51 A.D., this letter is probably close to the close of 62 A.D., so 10, 11 years later. I don't know that it's the first time he's written to them. Probably not, I'm guessing, but it's the only letter we have that God saw fit to put in his Scripture. So here he is, some 11 years later, sitting in a prison again in the midst of persecution, which they are now starting to feel. Remember, they lived in a Roman colony. Now Paul sits in Rome itself, and he's under arrest. So the things that he's experiencing, they're going to start experiencing. In fact, just four years later, Nero would burn down Rome in 64 AD, blame it on the Christians, and great persecution would break out. I mean great persecution. He would impale Christians and have them tarred up and light them up to bring light around the gardens that were in Rome his own personal one. And then he gets captured again. He's released after this, probably, but then because of the great persecution, probably dies in 66 AD. Most scholars think, you know, probably about four years after this letter, he is re-imprisoned under Nero and executed, beheaded. I say that all to say, listen, you know, this letter is about joy. This letter is about joy in circumstances, all circumstances. And so when he begins to write, he, you'll see his personal touch here, but do not forget, this is God's word. So it's not just meant for them, the saints in Philippi. It's meant for you and me. It's meant for this church, this local church, because God's word is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. And so he digs in here, and I, he begins by talking about how they are with him, their, their partnership together with him. And that's kind of how he starts. 
Now, the occasion of the writing of the letter is they sent someone to him. This church is noted, in particular, the, the church in Macedonia. So, picture Philippi, maybe even the Thessalonican church, but he speaks of these guys to the church in Corinth and says, listen, they gave, they, they just poured out for me. They love him. The occasion of the writing of this letter is he, was, he had received a gift from them, missionary support. And he acknowledges it at the close of the letter and, and says this, I have received full payment. By the way, payment isn't in the Greek. I have received in fullness all, in, and I have received all, is what he says to them. But not as if there was some kind of payment going on. They supported him. And more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus, that's the, the member of the Philippian church that delivered it, the gifts that you have sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. He notes it at the end. And he was sending Epaphroditus back to them, thanking them for their gift. Like Betsy thanked you this morning for your gift on what we get to do with kids and and the youth and the adults, thank you. This goes on as you support ministry. That's the occasion here. So he greets them, and he loves them, and they love him. They were sending him. They, won. they knew the work he was doing was important. And so he starts out. And he, you know, it said we, you know in, in our culture, we sign our names at the end of a letter when we write it which is kind of silly. I, every time I get a letter from somebody, I, immediately, if I don't know who it's from, I turn to the last page and, oh, oh, and then I read it. I mean, I don't want to read all this stuff and not even know who it is. So, rightly so, you identify yourself immediately on the front end of a letter. And so goes the, the cultural norm here. Chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul introduces himself, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is one of the shortest introductions you'll find in all of his letters to the churches. We have 13 letters that Paul wrote, a chunk of them, most of them to, to churches and a handful of them to individuals. I'll say this, and you can bear it to be true if you go and you search. This is, the, a close second might be Thessalonica. This is the warmest greeting that you'll see come out of Paul. I say warm because he doesn't even identify himself. There is no stating of his credentials. To the church at Rome, I'm an apostle. To the Corinthian church, he notes he's an apostle. He's not He's not, he needed to affirm who he is in Christ. Ephesus, uh, the Colossians letter, Corinthians. Here, he introduces himself on an equal basis with Timothy, his spiritual son, whom they knew. He was there with them and calls them both. I'm a bondservant. We, Timothy and Paul, Paul and Timothy, bondservants in Christ. I mean, it just, it's warm. It shows you that he knows them and they know him. There was no need to restate, in a sense, to this church that he's an apostle. This is one of the warmest greetings there is. And then, you know, to the saints, the, the set-apart ones, right? What's a, what's a saint? Don't, uh, if you grew up like I did, you thought a saint was someone who became a specific person or a thing because somebody conferred a title on you after you died. Uh-uh. In Scripture, you're a saint is the same word as holy one. You've been set apart to the saints in Philippi. And by that, he meant everyone who had Christ in them. If Christ is in you, you're a saint. You're set apart. And he gets into that issue in a minute. You're a saint. You know, I know you don't look in the mirror and go, Saint Michael. <laughs> saint, I mean, fill in the blank. But God does. I mean, he, he pulled you out, made you different. To the saints there, and I love this because part of the church right now, part of the chapel is studying, so how do we do governance and leadership? I mean, in Scripture, look at how Paul writes to them. To the saints there, along with, together with is the Greek, along with those who oversee and those who serve. 
You're with them. I love that. And he writes to them, and they're all together. They're part of, the, of this local body there. That's important. And he greets them, and he, and he does as in, to this community, says, listen, grace to you, right? Grace to you. That's this unmerited favor of, of God's Spirit and His righteousness that now lives in you, and peace from God. That's a, that's a wholeness within you. And so he begins, begins with thankfulness. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now he starts out immediately telling them how he, he, he prays. Let me tell you about how I pray. And the first thing out of his mouth is, I thank God. I'm thankful to God. I want you to know how I pray. And the first thing out of his mouth is, I thank God for you. That's what he says. This is how we pray. This is how I pray. It's funny, he didn't say, I, I thank you. I thank my God. And I love my there. Do you refer to God that way? You introduce people to your wife. This is my wife. These are my kids. This is my dog. But when we talk about God, it's God. When Paul talks about God, it's my God. <laughs> I thank my God. Uh, it's, there's a personal touch to it. I thank my God every time I remember you. I thank him for that. In, in remembrance you, and all, always in every prayer of mine for all of you, right? For you all. We made it come from Georgia here. For you all, making my prayer with joy. There you go, first occurrence now. That is one of the key themes in this book, joy. That word will occur some 18 times in four little chapters. Joy, rejoice, rejoicing joy. And uh, why are you filled with joy? Well, it starts with them. And they were on his heart, and he was on there. Look how he refers to them. Chapter 4, therefore, my brethren, the, the word is brothers and sisters in its meaning. My brethren, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown. I mean, he had them, and they had him. Now, what are you rejoicing for? Now, here, look at his prayer. What are you rejoicing for? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. See, I told you he would go back and reference the beginning of that church. Here's why I thank my God. Here's why I rejoice. I'm rejoicing over the fact that your partnership with me, and we are partners together. Like we do this thing together. Like, you're in this with me, and I'm in this with you, and we've got this partnership going on. There is this unitedness that they were now into, even though there they were in this Roman colony, and there he was in the heart of the Roman Empire. He's sitting in Rome at this point, and he talks about their partnership, their unity together. It's not just a partnership. See, what could you be partnered over? They're not partnered over some nationality. They're not partnered over their race. They're not partnered over co-belligerence. That's the $50 word for meaning, you hate this, I hate this, we're partners. We tend to partner over co-belligerence all the time. You hate this, I hate this, we're together. They're not partnered because they're of the same denomination. They're partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what binds them together. Jesus. That's what he says. Your partnership in the gospel. Christ is the gospel. Who he is, what he does, what he is doing, what he will do. Jesus is the good news. That's what the angel said. I have good news and great joy for you. Today is born <laughs> Jesus. He is the good news. And they were partners from the beginning, right? Your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. That's the, that's the thing that binds us together, and it's a powerful bind, right? Remember the jailer, and he comes to faith because Paul and Timothy presented God's word to him, and he believed. We're partners because you're sitting here, and you have believed the good news of Jesus. You heard that he loves you. You heard that you're a broken mess without him. You are dying. And I'm not talking about what's going to happen in a funeral home one day. I'm talking about what's going to happen in eternity forever. 
you are dying. God loves you, and you're dying without him forever. And then, and then the gospel. But God sent his son to save you. That if you would believe in him, you would have forever life. And he, he shows resurrected life by rising from the dead. That's it. If we try and hang bells and whistles on that and, and do all kinds of, we're, we're going to mess it up. That's it. And by believing in him, you would have life in his name. Done. I'm in. He's in me. You're, you're a partner. We're partners now. And that's exactly what he says to them. There's the power of the gospel that surrounds the gospel and it surrounds Jesus. Look down at verse 7. He reiterates this point, which is worth noting here. It's right for me to feel this way about, about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace. There's the entrance into the partnership. You are a partaker of grace. You have, you have entered into him. He has entered into you. You have now partaken of grace. That is Christ in you, unmerited favor that grants you eternal life forever, a partaker of grace. Wow, I love that. Like, that's the gift of life. I mean, Christ said this when he, when he, he prays in this context of partakers of grace. We're different now. John 17, in his, this high priestly prayer to his father before the cross, he says, he says to him, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. See, you're, you're different now. You're separated. You're a saint. You're set apart. You were in the world and of the world and now you are in the world and not of the world. That's what changed. Now you're a partaker of grace. He would write to the church at Corinth, he who's joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. One. There's our unity. It's him. It is not anything else. Not, a, not the color of our skin, not our nationality, though I wish you were all Italian. <laughs> it, it, it's not your denomination. God really doesn't care about denominations. Write that down. He doesn't. It's Christ in you that unites us. We're one with him. That makes us family. So partakers of grace. And as a result, right, we, we share with him all these things. We, we, you are all partakers of me with me of grace, see it's with him, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See, there's a partnership. Whether he's sitting in prison, they're with him. If he's defending the gospel, they're with him. They're partners. For God is my witness how I yearn for all of you with, with the affection of Christ Jesus. See, there's this beautiful partnership. And Paul's explaining in work and reward. See, we mess that up because we're so tainted by the ways of the world. We think one element is more important than another. It is not. We, we, we bring this, this, this odd texture. If you're a partner with someone, let's say you're a partner in business, and your business partner goes out, and when she comes back, she says, man, I had a, ooh, I lost a lot today. You should panic. You're, you're a partner. You lost a lot today. Or she comes back and says, wow, we, I killed it today. Guess what? We killed it. Partners. Paul's sitting in a prison. Paul's defending the gospel. You're with me, he says on this. I love Christ's flattening of the reward. He, he says this. We, we're so used to he who is most visible somehow will receive more. That's wrong. He says these words, Matthew 10 and verse 40, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. 
and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. You see the flattening of the reward? If you show hospitality to someone who presents the word of God, a prophet brought the word of God to the people, then you get the reward of the prophet. Ooh, I like that. That's awesome. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's, my, he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. See, we're, we're so used to the one most visible. Oh, yeah, he's going to be first in line. She's going to be first in line. The ones that are watching and are caring and loving for our kids right now, their reward is the same. It's the entrustment. There's high value in God's eyes. Tremendous value. So Paul writes to them, wanting them to know in the context of this partnership, that's how it works. And then verse 6, right? He, I jumped over this just to flesh out partnership, but I love this passage, maybe the most famous one in this little introduction. And, and I'm sure of this, he says, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Like, God, you started this. He started you from the very beginning. He started this church, this group of people. It is, you is plural here. Like, you're, you're not done yet. You're, 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 he's the baker and you're the cake. And you're baking. You're not done yet. This kind of passage gives, ought to give you hope in the mirror. It does me. He who started a good work in you, he's still working on it. And he'll see it through. He'll bring it to completion until the end. It makes you patient in the mirror and it ought to make you patient with each other. Because you're not done yet. I'm, I'm still baking. And, you know, the baker makes you, puts you in the oven. He'll pull you out an hour or so later, stick a toothpick in you. <laughs> Work the analogy here. Ouch! And if there's still junk hanging on it, back in the oven. See, I know a little bit about baking. <laughs> My wife taught me. <laughs> stick the toothpick in it. Do you see anything? Yeah, it's not done. Back in the oven you go until you're done. And it's not for your, it's not for you. The baker makes the cake that he might enjoy the cake. It's for the baker. When it's the fallen cake that somehow thinks it's about you, you silly muffin. <laughs> it was never about you. It always is about him. God's always doing something with you to the end of his glory and lifting you up and changing you that he might be known by you and by the others that you are affecting. David prays in, in the Psalms with this, this, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He's got this purpose for you. Uh, uh, Psalm 138, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Don't forsake the work of your hands. What would that be? Me, David would say. What you're doing with me, the work of your hands. Be patient with me, and I, I'll be patient with you because you're, you're half-baked right now. <laughs> now, you better be more baked next year than you were this year. <laughs> me too. If you're making progress in Christ, you ought to be getting closer to where he says here, he who began a good work in you will see it through until what? The, the day of Christ Jesus, that's when you're done. Now here, probably the most beautiful prayer. I love this. One of the first prayers I memorized in Scripture because it's so short. Why did you memorize that one? Because it's only three verses. But man, what a prayer. Philippians 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 and I'll give it to you quickly, but I'll tell you this. If you want to pray for me, pray this for me. And when I pray for you, I'm, I want to pray this for you. And this is Paul writing to Philippi saying, listen, listen, saints and you overseers and servants there, all, you, all of you, this is how I pray for you. And this is my prayer, 
that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And here's my prayer for you. And look where he starts. And this is my prayer for you. Let me tell you this. Think of the last prayer you prayed. And I'm going to say it probably didn't sound like this. And sadly, if I don't have my head about me, the last 10 prayers I prayed didn't sound like this. I tend to pray for the circumstances to go away for someone's good. I tend to pray for, I don't know, we pray for a lot of things, and they're not bad things to pray for. Look at the level that he prays for this church. Look at how we pray for each other. And this is my prayer for you, that your love would abound more and more. The first thing out of his mouth for them is that their love increases, not that their knowledge increases, not that their discernment increases. He wants their love to grow. I pray for you that you would love more. I want your love to explode. The church that loses its love, the church that fails to abound more and more in love is a failed body of believers. Ephesus, Revelation, chapter 2. You lost your love. What happened to you? We got a great doctrinal statement. Good. Good. How's your love? I want your love to abound. That your love would grow how you treat, how you respond to God, how you respond to people. It matters in God's eyes. If you, if you lose your love and you've swapped it out for anything else, you lost. It's worthless, Paul would say, 1 Corinthians 13. Offer your bodies to the flames and you get nothing if you don't love. Wow, that's a big sacrifice. Zero, nothing. Love. So watch Paul's prayer here. Think of that when you pray for the church, pray for us, when you when we pray for each other. God, I want our love to abound. Because that that in the end that is so critical in terms of what matters. He wrote to the church at Corinth, which was so full of itself, knowledge, wisdom. They were right outside of Athens, and the Greek mentality was massive. They were wise in their own eyes at times. We know that all of us possess knowledge. He's throwing their quotes back at them, which he does often in this book, Corinthians. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he doesn't yet know it, as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he's known by God. That's where the great love chapter comes from, 13, to this church, to remind them, you've got to love. Knowledge? great. That's just a big head. You want a big heart first. Then your big head will make sense. I pray that your love abounds more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. See, it's not love in ignorance. It's love in in knowledge and discernment, depth of insight. So yes, love, love in truth, love with knowledge. That's where we got to resist and watch our tendencies in our culture. Our culture constantly wants to push us and say, love is approval of what I do no matter what I do. If you approve of me, you love me. And if you love me, you approve. That's not love. No no parent worth his or her salt. We all know that. Mommy, I want to touch that stove today. It's really hot. I want to touch it. Sure, sweetheart. I do, I approve. Do, Do what you feel like doing. I love you. Do it. Daddy, I want to play in the street today. I like it there. It's nice and flat. Sure, sweetheart. Because I love you, it's all good. Mom and Dad, I want to do this with my mind and this with my body, and I want to do this with my life. No problem. I love you. It's all good. (laughs) You know that's not right. No one raises their kids like that. I mean, I don't care whether you're a believer in God or not. You know that's not right. I mean, your gut, everything tells you that's wrong. So Paul says, listen, let your love grow, but not in ignorance, right? In knowledge and discernment. 
Set them apart in your truth. Your word is truth. You're a saint set apart by Jesus in truth. And, and his word is truth. So we pull towards him and we move towards him, not in ignorance, but in what he would have us to do. And that's important. Right, so that you may approve. There's the test word. That's an examine word. So that you may test, you may approve what is, what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. See, Paul's always got the end in mind too. And he wants them to think about this. You know, I, I, I want you to, to move this way and, and pull this way. Because love rejoices in truth. Right? That's what he tells them, 1 Corinthians 13, to this other church love doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, rejoices in truth. And therefore, as you examine and you test, you're, so that you might be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. I, I call this test for the best, right? The, the word excellent here is, is a worth high above, a high worth, a, an above worth. How do I know what to do? Well, uh, listen, it's not going to be my gut that tells me so that I can be, I want you to be without blame, without stain in the, in the day of Christ. It's who you are. It's who I want you to be. I want your love to abound in knowledge and discernment so that you can, you can test and approve what is good. I mean, that's, that's the way he prays for them. Look at Scripture in the sense of the way we, we work this out. Ephesians 5, 8. At one time you were darkness, Paul writes to them, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try and discern. That's the, that's the, there's the word. Try and discern what pleases God, what is pleasing to God. You just don't wing it. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I, I, I knew it from here. And so one thing about this prayer, which, which we rarely pray for each other, he starts with the inside of who you are and then what spills out as to what you do. You see, all his prayer so far has been who you are on the inside, not about what you're doing. I pray that your love might abound more and more in knowledge and discernment that you might be able to approve what is excellent so that you might be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. That, that's your inside. And here's the do. What spills out? Well, here's what spills out. Because Christianity is always an inside-out religion because it's Christ in you and now the production, now the, the fruit, of course filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. See, now the outside. I want you to be so that you might do, so that God might be glorified. Uh, now, isn't that a simple prayer? I want you to be what? A loving, a, a, a loving love abounding in knowledge and discernment. For what purpose, Paul? What is it that you want us to do? Bear fruit for God. Produce, fruit. You know, if you go in the store, I always, I always thought that was an interesting word when I started to read Scripture. Fruit, fruit, fruit. What's this fruity passage about? Fruit. We go into a store and you look for fruit. You're usually looking for a sign that says produce. The fruit was the thing that popped out of the tree that was living. Fruit. Simply comes out of the living tree. It doesn't bear fruit to gain life because it is alive. It bears fruit. So goes Jesus Christ in you. It's proof of what's on the inside. It doesn't gain life. But now the end, right? God's glory filled with the fruit of righteousness. I always, when I see fruit, I always, my mind always goes to Galatians 5, verse 20. And this is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. He's popping out apples of peace, patience. Here comes another apple, kindness. Here comes another production out of you, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. Wow, 
Wow, you're popping out the apples now. But why? So that someone could look and say something about your God. To the glory and praise of God. That's it. The cake was baked for the joy and goodness of the baker. And that's it. And that's how he prays. Jesus says this in John 15, the great fruit-bearing chapter in John. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <laughs> Are you, is what you're praying for right now fruit of the Spirit that points to the glory of God? That's a great question. Look at Paul's heart for them. Look at God's heart for us that our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we might be able to discern what is excellent, best, that we might be pure and blameless when Christ shows up. I'm here, the day of Christ, filled with production from his spirit in us so that God is glorified, so that God is glorified. Amen? Amen. Father, give us that. We pray that for each other you, you desire that for us. Paul prays this for this little young church in, in the midst of a Roman colony. I bet they were feeling out of place. God, help us feel out of place. This is not home. Thank you for calling us to love according to your word. Thank you for calling us to be pure and blameless before you. And thank you for calling us to a life that is productive. We want that. For your glory, in Christ's name, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.